You're listening to What The Four Podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Oh, this is a chance for Burns. It's the cross. But McGovern scores! Ah! He has the defence. And that's Howie the target. Howie will knock on. And Goodman! Ah! Ah! Oh, 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 Hello and welcome back to the What The Folk podcast. In the hot seat today is one of my personal childhood heroes, a man who first made me understand the importance of a moustache. Welcome to the show, Big Bad Don Goodman. You all right, Don? You well? I am very, very well, thank you. I, I, I love that phrase, still Big Bad Don. I've, st- I've still got the T-shirt. <laughs> I think somewhere I had one there, somewhere. I've got it. Yeah. Did you ever get that at any other clubs or was that just a Sunderland thing? No, that was a that was a Sunderland thing. I and mean, obviously I was a kid at West Brom. And by the time I got to Wolves, obviously they weren't going to make t-shirts about me when they got bully bully up there banging goals in left, right, and centre. So uh, no, no. I, I thank the Sunderland fans and uh, certainly the Love Supreme who printed it, as I recall, the, the firm was. creating that t-shirt. I, it's, it's a good t-shirt. I, I love that. Cracking t-shirt. We made some really good t-shirts. I remember the John K fan club. That was a good t-shirt as well. Yeah. Really delving back into my childhood here. God, they were good days. Um, okay. We'll start right from the beginning, I guess. Born in Leeds, 1966. A fantastic year for football, if I think we both agree on. But what are your earliest memories of sort of going to games, like your childhood memories? Uh, well, I think most people know by now that, that, that I'm a Leeds United fan, although um, the response I get from a, a small number of Leeds United fans about my views on over the last sort of 15 years until the last couple of years when they've been very, very, very good. You wouldn't know it, would you? But uh, yeah, so I mean, I got into football. I think the first World Cup I remember was 78 in Argentina. I was eight, obviously, by then. I was into football, obviously, before then. But it's the first, really, the world, it's the first of the World Cups. 1972, I remember Leeds winning the FA Cup. Alan Clark, diving header. Happy days, one of the best teams in the country. And then one of my er- earliest memories is Sunderland actually making me cry because <laughs> Jim Montgomery and Ian Porterfield and the like um, beat Leeds United in the 1973 FA Cup final. So, um yeah, uh, so I was crying at that, but obviously those are those are my really early early memories. And obviously paying, I think it was fifty p in a, a section of the Ellen Road stand to uh, to go and stand in what was called the boys' pen. So I think it was for under sixteens. And um, yeah, I used to go with my mates. Loved the football. Leeds, obviously, at the time were a very 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 good team. And you know, and then obviously you. you you start playing, you start playing for teams, you start pool, you start playing for Sunday league teams. And um, at that point, people start telling you that you're actually pretty good. And the rest sort of follows on quite, quite naturally, really. Although by the time I was 14 and I got into the Leeds City Boys school boy team, um, I'd been a goalkeeper prior to that. You wouldn't believe it, but for from sort of 11, 12 through to sort of 13, I'd been this goalkeeper who was a, a tiny little bit small and anything over sort of a certain height was always going to was always gonna be. So I went to Leeds City Trials, got turned down twice as a goalkeeper and then ended up going back the following year as a right winger and, and managed to get in the squad. But I was never really a regular player and I was one of the few lads actually, uh, Graham, that didn't have school, wasn't on schoolboy forms with a professional club that came um, a little bit later. When I ask, you know, were you always a striker? You've, I suppose you've answered that one, but I didn't expect to be a goalkeeper because to my memory, always quite an athlete. So they stick you in the place where you you sort of just stand still for the best part, but you did have a really good leap. I do remember that. Exactly, yeah, I think I think that was it really. So I was brave. I didn't mind going down at, at, at the other lads' feet. I, I loved the mud. I loved throwing myself all over. I was quite springy, as you've alluded to. So anything that was sort of below a certain height that was in my grasp, I was I was pretty pretty competent at, really. But I didn't really start growing until it was too late to be a goalkeeper. And actually, judging the height of me now, I was never, ever going to be a goalkeeper. So, you know, it was one of those things that, I, as I say, I went for a trial for the under-14s at the uh, as a right winger and, and managed to get into that 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 squad but as I said I was quite far down the pecking order I was never a regular uh, player um, 
14, 15, 16 for the Leeds schoolboy team. Got the odd cameo role, but certainly there were um, there were lads that were considered um, way, way ahead of me at that time, playing for some of the biggest clubs uh, in the country. Growing up when sort of I was young, mid-90s, I had some really, really terrible heroes such as Donga. I'm sorry, um, I mean Phil Gray. Um, <laughs> but you obviously grew up with a fantastic Leeds team, as you've already sort of ad- mm-hmm. adhered to. Everyone has their childhood heroes. We all idolise people, I think. So who were your sort of icons growing up then? Well, I could I could still name that entire team for you. Absolutely just like that. They were all actually superstars of the day. Funny enough, though, the player that I latched on to the most was Peter Lorimer. He used to get bought those those little blue sock tags with a number seven on for Christmases and birthdays. Um, hot shot Lorimer, hardest shot in football. And it was a few years later that I, I found myself playing for Bradford City and stood in a wall as he was lining a free kick up. So that was a terrifying uh, Terrifying thought, but no, that was a, a remarkable Leeds United team. Um, a little bit like Man United would go on to be uh, to become, actually, probably by the rest of the country, other than Leeds United fans, really. Uh, dirty Leeds, it still sticks to this day, but they were so much more than that, to be honest with you. Some of the talent, and obviously, um, sadly, many who who are no longer uh, no longer with us. But what a team they were! But in answer to your question, Peter Lorimer would have been my uh, my boyhood hero. Funny you say that about Leeds. That's kind of how I was brought up with obviously my dad. I think it was a similar age to yourself, and it, it was dirty Leeds. But then again, my dad's a big Brian Clough fan, so that, I think that says an awful lot. <laughs> As it was, I think you went to Collingham, but you also worked as like an electrician. Um, at the time as well. And I think you actually made your debut for Bradford before you became professional. But um, how did the path to, to Bradford happen then? And what are your memories of your, sort of that period in your life? Yeah, so I was spotted playing Sunday league football by uh, the manager of Collingham, a, a, a fellow called Ken Parkin, who was to be a, a huge influence on me over the next few years. Um, and Collingham were a team that were playing in the Northern Counties East League. So quite a decent level, you know, not that many leagues below the sort of um, the football league. So I started playing um, for Collingham. He headhunted three of us from its team, the Sunday league team. And I and I started playing with my two other mates, man's football at the age of 15, um, by which time I'd probably gone from a right winger and become more of a central uh, striker. But as I say, so I was playing at a very, very high level of, um, of amateur football at the age of 15. Uh, he then got me a trial, Ken Parkin, at Bradford City. I think I'd just turned 16. I'd left school with maths, English and physics O-levels. So that shows you how old I am, the fact that I was doing O-levels, um, which I'd, was what I needed to become an electrician. So I'd, I'd specifically decided at the age of 14 that I wanted to be an electrician, saw it as a good career uh, and a long-lasting career, something that perhaps a robot might not be able to do, i.e. lift up floorboards and go into the attics and so on and so forth. So I thought it was a good career, um, got my qualifications, then got a job with Leeds City Council working in their education department at the age of 16, as became an apprentice electrician. And it was at that time or shortly after that that um, uh, Ken Parkin got me this trial at Bradford City. Uh, Roy McFarlane was the the manager and ironically Bradford City junior team which is what I was going to be playing in that evening it was a midweek evening they were playing another team from the Northern Counties East League called Phoenix Park that I I recall so I kind of knew what it was going to be like anyway long story short Bradford City won 3-2 I scored all three goals and was offered a, an apprenticeship after straight after the game by Roy McFarlane but again and here's the good influence that I had in my life Ken Parkin who who had links to professional football, sort of had a chat with me and, and, and laid it on the line that actually only 10% of 16-year-old trainee or apprentice footballers actually go on and make a living at football. And those odds, Graham, they weren't good enough for me. So I actually said thanks, but no thanks that I wanted to continue with my um, apprenticeship as an electrician. Um, and Roy McFarlane then said, OK, well, there is a solution to that. We'll put you on what's called a non-contract, um, sign you on a non-contract basis which means that they could get rid of me or I could walk away at any time. And it worked really. So from that moment forward, um, I played on a Saturday morning for Bradford City Juniors, Saturday afternoon for Collingham, uh, Sunday afternoon for my um, for my Sunday team and and some midweek games in the reserve team for Bradford City. And you're right. It was uh, I did that for probably 18 months, by which time Roy McFarland had left for Derby County as the Bradford manager and Trevor Cherry had uh, had come in to take his place. Sadly, 
passed away recently, Trevor. And I have to say, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man he was. Uh, I will always be indebted to him. He gave me my opportunity as a, as a, as a young professional footballer actually was a very very positive influence uh, on me and and that Bradford City team that as as we're going to talk about w- would go on to do to do very very well so yeah I remember getting a phone call there was only two games of the season left got a phone call from Trevor Cherry to say um, can you get the afternoon off work I'm going to put you in the uh, in the first team squad you're going to be on the bench I was 17 at the time um and uh, we played Newport County and I think with, I can't remember exactly, probably with about 20 minutes to go, he, he threw me on as a, a, an apprentice electrician going on as a substitute for Bradford City and I made my professional debut against Newport County. So, um, you know, um, then I was on the bench for the last game of the season, I recall. Um, and then I was... My birthday was in May, so I made my debut in the April. So it wasn't that long afterwards where he decided that he'd like to offer me a professional contract, at which point the the situation changes from that of off being offered an apprenticeship to being offered a, a pro contract. I mean, I had a great job with Leeds City Council. Um, I had to cover the bases. So in that professional contract, I had to get a day release so I could carry on studying at college. And I also wrote to the electricity board um, to say that if I've got this wonderful chance of a lifetime to become a professional footballer, if it doesn't work out over the next two years, the duration of the contract, can I go back and finish my apprenticeship? And 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 they were fantastic about it. The electricity board said, of course, as long as you can find a, find a, an employer that will take you on as a slightly older apprentice to finish off, no problem whatsoever. And um, I made my debut against Wigan the following August. I remember missing an open goal on my full debut, which uh, it's amazing what you can remember about your full debut. But I remember going clean through and missing an open goal. That's that's pretty much all I remember. Uh, Terry Yorath, the assistant manager, gave me a bit of stick afterwards in a friendly, motivational way, shall we call it? I think I think we won the game. I think we won the game, so it was a, a get out of jail free card. But that's um, that's how I went from sort of schoolboy on the periphery um to become a professional footballer i think one of the uh the things that i could pick out from and obviously it was slightly before i was born sorry to bring that up i think november 1984 i think it was from what from reading up and sort of memories of bratford and stuff like that he's got a seven and a hat rack against Paolo. i think at the time you were playing with a man called or kind of were like learning from bobby bobby campbell indeed vast experience at that point and I think you spoke before about you know how important he was and his character but um how much did you enjoy it you know as a teenager playing alongside someone who'd basically been there and done that and was such a huge character yeah I mean there are many uh, there are many things to talk about really here in terms of that dressing room arguably the best dressing room I was ever in um in terms of players obviously I was the baby um uh, but there were players I like Stuart McCall, John Hendry, Peter Jackson was the captain. Bobby Campbell was a no question, an enormous uh, influence on me, taught me an awful lot. One of the principal things, if you cast your mind back to that era of playing, where you had to be able to look after yourself. So Absolutely. everything that yeah. everything that you saw, good or bad, in terms of physicality on a football pitch from me at Sunderland, it, it, it was as a direct result of learning from one of the masters uh in in Bobby Campbell again sadly no longer no longer with us but again another person that I'll be forever uh, grateful grateful to but uh, no there were times when I talk about the physicality obviously as I would go on later on in my career to do you try and intimidate youngsters I was 18 years old it was basically the equivalent of what is now league one it was very physical centre-halves would definitely try and intimidate me and um you know, after receiving the early obligatory clatter from behind, I would I would look around five minutes later. The centre half had blood coming from different parts of his nose and mouth and things like that. And it wasn't a one-off; it was a regular. It was a regular basis. So what I'm trying to say is, he looked after me. He really, really looked after me. He was a wonderful, wonderful goal scorer. I think he's still Bradford City's record goal scorer to this uh, day. And if you talk about Bobby Campbell when you're in the company of Bradford City supporters. He is revered and will be re- revered until the end of time. I'm, I'm absolutely sure. But yeah, it was a wonderful, 
dressing room to be in. It was a wonderful environment to be in for your for your first, you know, just turning professional. I learned a lot, not just from Bobby, but from all of those lads. Um, some that I haven't mentioned as well, but you can't mention all of them. But it was the greatest of dressing rooms. And I have to say, it wasn't that they moulded me as a as a footballer. They moulded me as an individual, as a person, um, that group of, of, of lads. And I'm sure most people would agree that most of the lads that have come out of that dressing room and gone into management or coaching or into the media, they, they are and hopefully come up, come across as grounded, level-headed, and, and just all-round good guys. You look at John Hendry, uh, who I think would have been about two or three years older, but still very much a youngster at that point. I think he was playing wing. It wasn't the place to be if you were in any team where Bobby Campbell was the centre-forward, because if you if you didn't cross it, there was him and Mark Ellis. Uh, they used to get dogs abuse from uh, Bobby Campbell, but it was what we would now call... Um, encouragement to deliver the ball into a certain area for him but he would tell you off um in no uncertain terms but yeah John was um one of the star players no no question of that team do you know how it's like a different world now I suppose with young players coming through and I mean I've never been in a dressing room a football dressing room don't get me wrong so I'm, I'm totally like surmising here but obviously it feels like um I don't know whether pampered would be the word but it is a different world now for young players coming through some players are in academy still at 21 22 and haven't played a professional game unless they've gone out on loan to somewhere in League One or League Two. Um if you say you could live in two different eras and you could have came up in this kind of world where maybe there's obviously a bit more money, more academies, more coaching, more nutrition, uh sports and uh, strength conditions, sports scientists and all that kind of stuff. Or back when you started when it was just about being a bit tough, having a character and being in that dressing room, would you change it? Or are you really pleased that you came up in that environment? No, I, I wouldn't change it. And people might think I'm mad in terms of all the money that, that, that is in the game now, but I wouldn't change it. Um, I think the one thing, the big thing missing from modern day football is characters. I want to say characters. You know, you're talking about your gazers and, and, and now, they're, now he was unique. He's a one-off. But what I'm saying is in terms of characters and, and leaders um, and a different mentality, um, sometimes too strong. I understand why it wouldn't be acceptable today but it was in the world that I that I grew up in it was strong arm motivation at, at times now it would be called bullying but they would argue back in the day that as long as they got a positive response from you and I was one of the kind of guys where you would get a positive response from me any kind of criticism um yeah I grew up in an era where teacups would fly you would teammates would pin you up against the wall and you know but it meant something it meant something it meant that you didn't want to be the person that let the team down. Um, and that was the reason for it. Now, again, I, I accept that in modern football, it might not be the way. You can do that with probably a small percentage of uh, players now, i.e. be quite firm with them in your criticism. Um, but to be honest with you, you're not going to get a positive response from most players. But it's not it's not a football thing, Graham. I have to um, really emphasise that. I just think mm -hmm. life has changed. I just think human yeah. being what's acceptable what's not it's a it's a, it's a, a society thing um so that's not me being critical of modern day players but in terms of the grounding i as i had as a human being the interaction that we were able to have with supporters i.e drinking in the same pubs uh spending time talking to supporters eating in the same restaurant and really being a part of the, the whole fabric of the football club and the community i wouldn't change it to be honest with you because the characters, the stories I have, some that I can tell, some that I can't tell um, <laughs> from those days growing up as a, as a, as a young professional footballer, they, they will stay with me uh, forever. Uh, I think professionalism abounds now in the modern day. Mobile phone technology means that you cannot step out of line in any way, shape or form. Um, it's just a totally different uh, uh, trade almost. Uh, the game's changed. Um, the type of football has changed and um, sadly I think the I think the interaction between players and supporters in the main has changed and, yeah. and that's a shame for the for the modern footballers now if you were to ask them whether they'd swap places with me I'm pretty sure conclusively not many not many of them would <laughs> there are two two sides of the coin I know what you're saying with it though that you are right it's it's not just a football thing it's a societal thing but talking about you know successful dressing rooms it was a really successful dressing room at Bradford and you enjoyed a lot of success at a really really young age and that success 
got you moved to to West Brom, who I think it was Ron Saunders signed you in March 87, I think. Didn't last very long yeah. as it was, but I think at the time West Brom had just been relegated. They were one of like the promotion favourites, I think, to go back up. Uh, whilst right. Bradford were in the same division, as far as I'm aware, but you know yeah. West Brom obviously was seen as because it came down one of those teams more likely to go up. Was that quite a big factor in your decision to move? Because obviously you had a lot of success at Bradford, but was it like seen as a yeah. progression? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it would be remiss of me to talk to you and, and include Bradford City in it without without just touching on what an amazing team it was. The fact that we absolutely romped that league, got Bradford City, yeah. little old Bradford City into the into the Championship. And then we we had the fire, didn't we? And and that was another thing that 56 people sadly lost their lives that day and and they will forever be be remembered. And they were part of making football a safer, football stadiums a safer place to be. So you just hope that families and friends of those can can take a tiny crumb of comfort. Um, But it was, uh, while it was a wonderful period on the pitch and we were successful, there was a period where we all went through hell, um, burying people, going to funerals on an almost daily basis. And, and, and that's not ever, ever, ever to be forgotten. And it is something that I think about on a very, very regular basis. Um, again, it would be remiss of me to point out that the following season, we couldn't play at Valley Parade and Little Bradford City, brand new to the what is now the championship, played 46 away games in essence, Graham. Yeah, and right in the middle of the table. And I think that's testament to how good that team and those players were and how strong we were. We were, we were, we were glued together like a band of brothers and, and, and knitted together by Trevor Cherry and, and Terry Yorath. And, and that was a wonderful grounding from a football a footballing sense that it came to an end because I... I, I, I Trevor Cherry sadly um, lost his job, got sacked. Terry Dolan, who had been looking after the youth team, took over. And although I was the top scorer, um, I I think I'd scored eight games in 16 appearances, which wasn't bad the the season that I left Bradford City. I wasn't in the team week in, week out, and I couldn't really understand why. Terry decided that he wanted to go down a different road. I played Ian Ormanroyd, a big tall Ian Ormanroyd, on a more regular basis than me. And I just think the timing for me and the timing for Bradford City was right. And with the greatest of respect to, to Bradford City as a football club, um, in terms of size and scope and history, and it, you can't really bracket the two clubs in, 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 in the same category in terms of the size of the two football clubs. So when uh, a £50,000 fee was agreed, um, uh, I remember think being really excited because quite ironically, obviously being a young black kid growing up back in those days I was actually a, a little bit West Brom was a, a, a team that I took to my heart actually because of my dad my dad used to love the three degrees so Regis Laurie Cunningham and Brendan Batson and as a kid I thought you follow your dad and you and you watch him of course West Brom were an exciting team under in, in that era under under Ron Atkinson um, who I would late, later play for, and that, that was a thrill as well. Um, so when that came about, it was a no-brainer for me, really. Um, but it was intimidating jumping in a car, I can promise you, driving down the M6 without an agent, knowing that you've got to negotiate a deal with Ron Saunders, one of the hardest men in football. Um, again, another another person that was hugely influential that I owe an awful lot to, who sadly is is, is no longer with us. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was it really. I couldn't really turn it down. Uh, it was a huge club. You're right in saying that they'd recently been relegated from the top division. I had hopes and expectations that they might be the vehicle to get me from that level up to the, 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 the next level. Um, and I had the final 10 games. It was when the transfer deadline day was at the end of March, Graham. If you remember those days. But Do you actually? That's me yeah, feeling old yeah. now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and end of March. It's all changed since. But I, I did go on deadline day. It was the only move I ever made on a... Oh, no, I went to Walsall on deadline day as well, as I recall. So two moves on deadline day. That was the first one. And, um, you know, I look back on my five years at West Bromwich Albion with so much pride because... Although I was appreciated at Bradford City, they had they had other heroes. They had better players than me. West Bromwich Albion were the first set of fans that actually really put me on a pedestal, made me feel ten foot tall, sang my name week in week out, embraced me, 
uh, you know, and, and I, again, I, I keep, I keep reflecting, you know, when you reflect, you realize how many people that you do have to thank for the yeah. journey that you've had. And certainly the West Bromwich Albion fans, um, again, who on Sky, there's some tiny element, don't, you know, don't like the fact that, that, that you, when you're a pundit, you have to have opinions. And sometimes they don't like the opinions you, you have. They also didn't like the fact that I went to play for Wolves after that as well. But that's another story I'm sure we'll come on to. Um, <laughs> I was going to say that one. Yeah, it's a tiny minority. And, and, and those five years at West Bromwich Albion, they, they actually really moulded me and set me up. And, and as a player, they took me to another level from what I'd left Bradford City at. Because when you leave a club at, at 20 years old, you still have your raw... Uh, I'd played 70 games by then. But I still had so much to learn because you never you never stop learning. And at West Bromwich, I mean, there were some very, very experienced, very good players. Derek Statham, Martin Bennett was still there. Paul Dyson was was a, a centre half. Big George Riley was, I think, my first ever strike partner at, uh, at West Bromwich, Albion. And I'm and I would go on to play with an awful lot of other experienced players like Andy Gray and Arthur Alberston, uh, Arthur. Um, Graham uh, so there, there, there was there were so many lads to learn from in those days and but the biggest influence um at my from my time at West Bromwich Albion was was Stuart Pearson who Ron Atkinson had actually brought into the football club um I mean what a player he was he was still the best player in five sides despite the fact that he, he he'd retired long long before I think he was always the first pick um but he invested time in me Graham uh, Stuart Pearson again owe him an awful lot used to keep me back just 10 minutes on a daily basis for a, two or three months it took to work on how to get the best out of my strengths how to improve my weaknesses and um, basically his input turned me from a striker that would score one goal every five or six games into one that would for that then sustained period where you're at your peak years would would, would average a goal every two games and obviously you were you got you got to see um, an improved version uh, again when I when I got to Sunderland. When you were talking about before about uh, going to West Brom and how you know the fans sort of took you and stuff like that, it's it's funny that you say that. And it's I was going to touch on him as well because I've I've seen that you know you do credit an awful lot to him for basically I think maturing you a little bit um, at that sort of young age till till twenty one twenty two I think when you first went there. Um, I think it was at West Brom where you could probably be safe. You don't mind me saying you got viewed as the goal scorer. You came to be known. You scored a lot of Bradford, but I feel like it was West Brom where people like, I remember when we signed you even as a really young boy and it was like, yeah, you can score goals. Like people mm -hmm. knew about that. And obviously it was no real surprise, you know, that you moved to Sunderland came at a big fee as it was at the time. But before we go on to sort of Sunderland, what was your best memory in terms of being on the pitch from your time at West Brom? Because it was a supremely successful time. Well, it wasn't really that successful, I have to say. Um, individually, individually, it was very successful. In, in, I beg your pardon. Individually, yes, I was I was scoring goals in a team that, um, I mean, my best, it, it, it was the best goal scoring season I ever had was 21 league goals yep. um, in 38 games. So, and that was the influence that Stuart Pearson uh, had had on, on my game. Uh, increase that goals output. Perhaps got me a little bit more selfish and made me understand that strikers will be judged on goals rather than the hard work and the, and the assisting and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I had I had scored a lot of goals for West Brom, and that that really was where I I was elevated to a level where where people did like yourself did know about me, did know that I could certainly do it at that level. So, but I scored a hat trick uh, for West Bromwich Albion that I'll always remember because it was against Crystal Palace and Crystal Palace were a, were a decent team, uh, but it was my first league hat-trick. So you, you alluded to the fact that I'd scored a hat-trick for Bradford City at Tolor Town. I'd come off the bench and scored a hat-trick in seven minutes seven in the FA yeah. Cup, but slightly different to get your first league hat-trick <clears throat> where Crystal Palace, as I say, were a good team. I think uh, at the top, they had Ian Wright and Mark Bright up front. Um, they had Jeff Thomas. Jeff Thomas uh, in the middle, yeah. And they had many, many good uh, good players in that team. Uh, and we, I remember the game because we won it 5-3. So, a thrilling game. And I scored what, what people class as the perfect hat-trick. Hat left foot, right foot, header. header. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I would say many goals I scored, many highlights, games that we would, you know, but as, a, as, a, as an overall game, then, then that would be my highlight from, from my time at West Brom. And obviously you moved towards something, and I suppose still kind of touching on West Brom a little bit here. If I remember rightly, the West Brom fans at the time really didn't like you because of that or really weren't fond of the move because I think it was highly publicised. Um, but I think in the years to come, there was a different side of the story. It wasn't just like you up and just left the Sunland. I think there was a few things in the background where, as you hear a lot of the time with footballers, when a move's happening, sometimes a club needs to bring a little bit of money and there was a little bit more to it than you just upping and leaving, wasn't there? Oh, good grief. I mean, look, at the end of the day, we you spoke about the time I had, but West Bromwich Albion in that era, they weren't a successful team. And actually, a, in a in a massively injury-ravaged season that I had, I'm not saying that I would have kept them up, but I think I scored eight goals in 16 games. That was the season they got relegated to League yeah. One. And I, was, I had a terrible injury problems with hamstrings and calves. And you know the situation is desperate and that you know that your club are in a, a relegation fight and you're playing and you're fighting and you're strapping for the fans. And that probably led me trying to get back on at least two or three occasions that season from injury prematurely, which obviously resulted in making the injury worse and and an extended stay out. But long story short, we went down, um, we got relegated to League One. Um, That wasn't a, a level that I felt as an individual that I belonged at, my my hopes when I signed for West Brom was to get to the top division yeah. um, not to be going the other way in fact that was I hadn't even considered that we might go down but it was a club in transition and it was a club with financial difficulties and that, that, that is the double-edged sword and that is the other caveat yes uh, I needed to go and further my career for me and for my family um, but also the club needed some money um, and the 900000 that that Sunderland paid went a long way to alleviating some financial problems that West Bromwich Albion had at the time. And of course, it got me to a club where I was convinced, again, very similar story to West Brom, Sunderland not long out of the top division. Massive, massive club history, fans um, that I wanted to be on the right side of. I'd often been to Roker Park and been on the other <laughs> the other side. And when you get the chance to go and play, you've got the Roker Roar going on and the, the, the fans are, for you, special really, really special. And it was a part of the decision that I made to to go, along with the fact that I had a, an awful lot of respect for Dennis Smith, who took me up there um, and believed, genuinely believed that Sunderland were going to be ambitious and were going to be the vehicle to get me up to the um, what had now become the Premier League at the time. It's funny when you mentioned Dennis Smith, I um, obviously interviewed Borley about how Borley was introduced from Portsmouth going towards Sunderland and he said he didn't just like you know, do what they do, maybe modern day, show you the stadium and show you the the training ground and things like that. He said he took them all the way around. Like, how did he sell something to you? Did he sell it as a club or did he sell it as a club and also city in a place? He sold it as the whole package, um, the culture, the fans, it, the religion of football, what it is to Northeast supporters. And I have to say that it would be remiss of me to discount. I know you won't like it, but the Newcastle fans, because... Sunderland fans, Newcastle fans, Middlesbrough fans to maybe a slightly lesser extent. No doubt I'll get some complaints about that. But the passion <laughs> the passion up there, he explained it to me. I'd witnessed it being on the opposition, but it's not until you get into that bubble that you truly get it when you're immersed in it. And I even now still find it difficult to describe and explain to football supporters that are not from up there, what it means and what it is. And it's like a religion up there. And the passion is just, just saying it's passion is, 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 is not doing it justice really. So don't get me wrong. There was the ambition of the football club. The football club wanted to get back to the Premier League, wanted yeah. to get back to the top flight. And for me, the fact that they just allowed Dennis to double the transfer record, you know, and, and pay £900,000. Tony Norman, I think was four fifty the previous transfer record at the time. It was a lot of money. Um, they brought in Johnny Byrne and Anton Rogan, who were, who were going to be to become two of my best mates at Sunderland. Um, so I saw that they were ambitious. I saw that they wanted to take the club in the right direction. And um, I think I think the FA Cup run um, that was to be had, that I was to be cup tied for. Let's um, lest we forget. But I think what that 
actually highlighted was that what a good set of players we had, yeah. but how inconsistent we were. And it was that lack of consistency that was going to stop Sunderland from getting to the Premier League um, during my three years at the club. Because uh, most of the time we had a good team and on any given day we could beat anybody, but we just never found that consistency but getting back to your question about how Dennis sold it to me it was no question it was the ambition it was the fans it was what it means to the fans I loved Roker Park as well of course you've got to remember at that stage there weren't the plans uh, in place or I certainly didn't know of them to yeah to go to the stadium of light so um but for me it was all set up to be a very successful football club and a vehicle to get me to the Premier League I loved Roker Park you Maybe not on camera, you might not be able to see it, but you see my little pet lip when you said, I loved Roker Park. So did I. I really did. What a fabulous place to play. Even when it was going bad, it was a funny place. <laughs> um, but one of the big things I remember, I mean, I was my first ever game was 1990, but I didn't really understand even what a corner was until about 92. So 93, I'm very, very <laughs> young. Um, but I still remember Marco getting sold. And I remember like it being heartbroken kind of like when Phillips left in the, the you know the years to come. Uh, you came in as Mark was replacement, essentially in the fans' eyes, if we're honest with each other. You came in on a little bit less money. I think we sold him for 1.8, Mark was it was. But you came in as quite a young lad that had been scoring goals. Were you feeling any pressure to be Mark was replacement? Was there much more excitement with that? No, I was, I, I was never... I was never of a nervous persuasion. I wasn't one of those players that got nervous before games, no matter how big the game was or anything like that. So I wasn't really nervous about the price tag, although I, you know, I, I would acknowledge that for that, December 1991, £900,000 was a serious amount of money, especially yeah, for a club operating in the, second, in the second tier. So, but I, did, I didn't think of it as, as, as replacing Marco. You, obviously, I'd been playing well by that, time scoring a lot of goals in a in a in a team that was struggling actually so I, I had faith in my ability that I could go there and deliver um deliver the, the goals deliver success certainly as was my trademark really deliver everything that I've got being left out on the pitch no you know sweat blood run myself into the ground for the cause I, I could promise them and I had faith that that would be enough for um the Sunderland fans to take me in uh, embrace me and um, thankfully for me I was right I mean touching Marco Mark, I know Marco well now we've done a couple of charity things together and we actually spent five nights down in the bottom camp together roommates in the bottom of the Grand Canyon raising money for charity so um, and and people Sunderland fans say what what do you think would have happened if you'd have played up front if they'd have kept Marco and brought you in and it is a question that you often, you must ask yourself in terms of that might have been um quite a nightmare for defenders but I get the same about West Brom because I was replaced at West Brom by Bobby Taylor and West Brom fans think yeah, if only we Bob kept Taylor. on and got Bob Taylor in and so on and so forth so you're always going to have the if buts and maybes but in answer to your question I never really felt the pressure to succeed because I was replacing Marco It's really funny when you look back at your, your first two games that you played for Sunderland though like they're both just memorable in so many different ways. I mean, for those who, yeah. who don't remember, obviously your, your away funnily enough, your away debut was at, at Wolves when we went down to, I think we went down to nine men in about 10 minutes or something like that. And then lost in the last minute, I think as well. Uh, Screaming yeah. from about 30 yards out of my mouth. I can't remember who scored it, but... Um, that's right. So he did. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, that kind of debut, right? We'll, we'll go on to the one... Well, actually, no, we'll touch on the one afterwards. And then the game after that, Roker Park, you score a loop and header in the 90th minute. Um, have you ever had a like a more of a mental first two games coming into your, any club? <laughs> but that was bizarre. I mean, it's very Sunland, but it's like... <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to throw into the mix um, what the Wolves fans at that time in my career thought of me, which wasn't a lot, to be fair. So I, I got uh, the worst the worst away game I could possibly have had um, to make my debut for Sunderland was going to be Molyneux and Wolverhampton Wanderers away. I got absolute dog's abuse from the minute I stepped off the coach to the minute I got back on it afterwards. So, yeah, it's quite ironic how football works, isn't it, really, that a few years later I'd, I'd be going and being cheered by the same people that were booing me. But I'm used to that. So, um, yeah, in answer to your question, I remember it well. I remember, again, 
warm up done, kicking off. Right, let's let's have it. Let's let's make Wolves pay. Uh, I'd always loved playing against Wolves. I'd loved the crack with the Wolves fans when I played for Sunderland against Wolves. I had some memorable times playing for Sunderland against Wolves. Um, but that came after the debut, obviously. Um, I can't remember who went first, but I think it was Gordon Armstrong got sent off very, very early on. Um, Johnny Byrne was the other one, I think. John Byrne. John Byrne. Listen, the one thing I'd say about John, technical genius, brilliant footballer, but he was never, ever going to get two yellow cards for two tackles. I think he got sent off for descent for a second. <laughs> Literally... Five minutes in, there I am on my full debut for Sunderland, record signing, really looking forward to it. And we are down to nine men. And I remember just thinking, this is, I couldn't have made this up. You've could, you got to be kidding me, like, you know. Um, but what I also remember realising at the time is how resilient uh, the defence was. Benno, Borley, you know, to name but two, Tony Norman was in the goal. And I got, for the one and only time I ever played as a professional footballer, I got the unique instruction, because Dennis obviously brought me in. He knew that I was decent in the air. He instructed Tony Norman to hit me on the, I'd, from the goal kicks and, and, and kick outs. I'd stand on the, the wing, right or left, and Tony Norman would hit me. I'd head it out of play for a throw into Wolves and get back behind the ball. <laughs> It was like giving us a breather, really, you know? Yeah. And it worked until the 90th minute um, when Cookie smashed that, that left foot thunderbolt in. So um, disappointing result. Uh, lots learned about the resilience and the commitment and, and, and how good some of our defenders and goalkeeper were that day. But it was like onwards and upwards. The next game was the home debut against Leicester City. And thankfully, that, that, that worked out much better. So you were part of a side that got all the way to the FA Cup final. You're playing every single week apart from the FA Cup games because you're unable to play a part due to being cup-tied. So everyone wants to get to Wembley in the FA Cup final. Nobody wants to be cup-tied. So what, what was it like being part of the side that was on such a phenomenal cup run that yeah. you were playing in every week, but not when it came to the quarter-final, the semi-final, the final? Is that hard? You will see that I got a big grin on my face because that is... That's a memory that I treasure. So what I did was I embraced it. I became a fan. And you've got to remember the era. So we're talking 1992 now, where there was a little bit of a drinking culture still going on in football, you have to say. So I, I took it upon myself to support the lads every step of the way. I went to every single FA Cup game, uh, home and away. Um, and I celebrated with the players, with the fans, like you do when you've won an FA Cup tie. And the further... We got in the competition, the more celebrating was being done, obviously, because we were the lads were magnificent and they were beating West Ham and Chelsea and Norwich, all teams that were, were in the top division. So in answer to your question, I never at any stage felt sorry for myself until the semi-final. And even then it was only a it was only a um a fleeting moment where I came out just before the teams who were lining up in the tunnel and I was going to go and sit on the dugout. I turned uh, towards the dugout, walked towards it, and I just saw that wall of Sunderland fans at Hillsborough. And that, that was the only moment where I thought, look at what you're missing out on. Look at what you're missing out on. This is the FA Cup semi-final at Hillsborough. Uh, a really wonderful traditional venue for, for FA Cup semi-finals. The Sunderland fans had packed it out, making an unbelievable amount of noise, sea of red and white, just a remarkable atmosphere. And, and, and that was the only moment, really, to be honest with you, that I felt a little bit sorry for myself. But of course, once John Byrne had scored, once the game was done, the lads were at the final at Wembley, not an ounce of self-pity, lots of partying to be done. <laughs> 